Lieutenant Shrawl walked quickly across the busy courtyard. The clipped staccato beat from his stiff leather shoes offered a steady counterpoint to the sporadic and syncopated gunfire coming from the ranges. Here was the practice and testing area for the Duke's Corps of Engineers. The bustling courtyard nestled at the heart of the research and development wing. New guns and weapons were put through their paces, and some of the more elite units in the new Antioch Armed Forces could often be found practicing here. Getting to grips with whatever new weapon or procedure was to be tested in the field by the very best, before hitting mass production for the rest of the war effort. Some would accuse the engineers of moving too slowly, but only the most efficient and most reliable weapons could be sent to the Duke's factories for mass production. The men and women of New Antioch needed and deserved the very best. Hell was adapting to a protracted, centuries-long war against mankind, and mankind must do the same. As the lieutenant moved down the lanes that had been sectioned off as firing ranges, other people in the courtyard turned to take a look at him. Even among the highest ranking members of the Duke's armies, those who outranked him would often catch themselves taking a glimpse at this man of legend. Lieutenant Schroll, a former British noble who had been guaranteed to live a life a safe distance from the war, had packed in the glitz and glamour to risk it all in no man's land. And there, not only had he survived against the odds, he had somehow bubbled to the top of the military cauldron to become a man not of mere rank, but of responsibility. Everyone knew Schroll was one of the Duke's own personal assets, and that the Rough and Readies acted only on his instruction, although nobody had ever seen Schroll within a mile of the Duke himself. The rumours made Schroll chuckle, although they were useful as they kept him and his squad clear of the inner politics of New Antioch. Most men would develop an ego at such fame, at being considered one of the very best among the very best. Schroll had seen action too many times, and was too aware of the fact that the only difference between him being alive and dead was essentially just luck to have developed any real sense of arrogance. He was a soldier, and he did soldierly things. Those things needed to be done, and someone needed to do them. If not him, then it would just be somebody else. It really was that simple. He reached the end of the line just as the figure there stopped firing rounds from an almost comically large handgun rattling hard into steel plates cut out in the rough shape of people further down the range. I see you're still practicing with Gulliver, said Shrawl, as the man turned and fired off a firm, respectful salute. Shrawl looked him over, seeing a very different person to the scared and broken boy he had first met nine months previously. You look well, Anton. You look healthy. Thank you, sir, Anton replied. I've done everything as dictated by the medical corps. I've met with clerics as instructed. I've dedicated myself to physical challenge and the study of both Bible and field manual. I am ready to return to the field, sir. Schroll could detect a hint of happiness, but also slight desperation in Anton's voice. He had been in limbo for almost a year since they had returned to New Antioch with him in a sorry state, his unit dead and God knows what crawling around inside his head after unintended exposure to a holy relic. Yes, I rather think you are, Anton. With me. Schroll turned sharply and walked quickly away, leaving Anton scrambling behind him, trying to clear the field table of his weapons, cleaning kit, and ammo. Leave Gully, Schroll called back. You won't be needing it for this. Or rather, it won't be much help even if you do, Schroll thought, darkly. The room they entered was cold and barren, save for a large, long, square table with four wooden chairs in it. It was also empty of any person other than them. Anton looked at Schroll, ready to ask a question, but Schroll's expression let him know that now was not a good time for curiosity. After a few minutes of waiting in the frigid room, another door opened, and the person that stepped inside caused Anton's heart to skip a beat, and he felt his blood run cold. The figure that stood before him was clad in red from head to toe. He was not a big man, but it was by far the most intimidating human that Anton had ever met. Even without the armour that would have adorned him on the battlefield, they were instantly recognisable due to the red metal face mask and long white wig that they wore. A witch burner. Sit. The voice that came from behind the mask was surprisingly gentle, but Anton found himself walking to the table and sitting down even before making a conscious decision to do so. The words held such weight of command that not doing as instructed seemed impossible to him. He took the seat at what would have been the foot of the table, as far from the witch burner as possible. The route here had confused Anton, 
down endless steps into a part of the fortress city that was New Antioch that he had never been in before. They had long since left daylight behind and were deep underground by now. Anton trusted Schrall implicitly, but he had never questioned where the man was leading him, but he was now aware that there was a real chance that he might never leave this room. The witch burner just looked at him, and Anton could feel the primordial coldness behind his eyes. Whether Anton lived or died meant nothing to him at all, and he would likely have Schrall killed just for standing near Anton if he decided that he was compromised. After all, proximity equals guilt was the fabled saying of the witch burners. The witch burner said nothing for what felt like an eternity. He stared into Anton's eyes, asking nothing, never blinking. Anton could feel a desperate desire to look away, to hide that central part of himself that felt so exposed in the face of the brightly burning righteousness of the witch burner. Surely every sin that Anton had ever committed was being weighed and measured, stacked as kindling and used to fuel the fires that would be burning his immortal soul. Anton could feel his fingernails starting to strain against the hard varnished surface of the tabletop and he wasn't sure how much longer he could sit in front of this man. The witch burner seemed to grow taller, larger somehow, more threatening on a level that Anton had never felt before and could not possibly hope to explain. The deep red robes like a blood stain against the hard cold white of the walls. Then he simply stood, walked to the thick heavy door, pulled it open and left. He didn't say a word or look to Schrall, or look back at all, he just left. Anton could hear Schrall breathe out, only then becoming aware that he had also been holding his own breath. Well, I'd say that went, went quite well, Schrall said, his words reverberating harshly off the surfaces of the empty room as he leaned back against the wall in relief. We are, after all, still alive. The whiskey was warm against the memories of the cold room, but every time Anton blinked he could see the blood-red splash of the witchburner's robes against the stark white of the walls. He couldn't help but wonder what kind of splash he would have made had the witchburner concluded that he was to be damned. They were back in the private section of the barracks that the Rough and Ready's Shrald unit called home. It wasn't much, just two rooms with a collection of beds and footlockers, but nobody but the Ready's would dare to come here. The rest of the unit was off doing god knows what, and when Schrall had entered he went straight to Burke's footlocker, opening it and taking out a dark blackened glass bottle. Nobody else would ever go through Burke's stuff for fear of a broken skull, but Burke would also never be angry at the lieutenant. The whiskey was the stuff that Burke made himself, distilling it somewhere, somehow, in secret within the walls of New Antioch. Nobody ever asked him how he did it, or where and somehow the mountain of a man was able to get himself around New Antioch without anybody knowing where he was going. Stories went around the barracks about a legendary batch that Schrall had made using engine coolant that had turned a squad of Prussian shock troopers blind for a week, but Anton was sure that that was just a story, although as the whiskey bit into his throat he wasn't so sure. Schrall poured two new glasses, almost to the brim, and the two men sat in silence and drank, the harsh amber liquid settling their nerves a little. Do you mind telling me what's going on, Lieutenant? Yes, Anton, I bloody well do. Schrall looked at him with a strange expression, and Anton momentarily thought the other man was angry at him. You were back in the readies, and we've a job to do. Anton knew that pushing was a bad idea, but he also couldn't help himself. Nine months of being poked and prodded and told what to do, what to read, when to eat, when to sleep, when to pray, constantly on edge, and then, finally, just when he was starting to relax and feel that everything was getting back to normal, he was led into a room with one of the very few people who could have had him killed on the spot with a thought, without anyone so much as batting an eye. Lieutenant, I know I messed up with the relic, I know. Anton, Schrall cut him off. This is an order. You are to stop this line of inquiry immediately. You are not to mention the meeting earlier today with anyone at all. Official word is that you are combat fit and have been assigned to this unit at my request. If you say anything to the contrary, to anyone, I'll shoot you myself. With that, Schrall got up and left, leaving him with nothing more than the bitter warmth of Burke's whiskey to keep him company. Anton and the squad were glad to be out of the Aegis. The massive war wagon was more tank than anything else, and made for an uncomfortable ride. Even the members of the Rough and Ready's long-time squad mates and comrades found their patience being ground down by it, and Anton had done his best to match their social mores. 
You had spent just two weeks training with them prior to setting out, but it was long enough to pick up on just how dangerous these people were and why they were so famous among the troops of New Antioch. Shrawl was quick-witted and razor-sharp. He was ridiculously accurate with pistol and rifle and was the only man Anton had ever seen to fire a massive Gulliver pistol with pinpoint precision. Burke was a monster, carrying a grenade launcher as if it were a toy. At six foot eight and 300 pounds, people said he had once been a member of the mechanized infantry, but Anton had never heard of anybody giving up the suit, so he put that down to just being a story. Ursula Gerhard was an engineer, and Anton had never seen someone able to wire something to explode so quickly in his life. She was also a brilliant mechanic, and between her and Burke, they seemed to keep the Aegis running no matter what. Ursula wouldn't let any other weaponsmith touch the squad's gear, and saw to the care of all their arms herself. The first thing she did upon learning that Anton was assigned to the readies had been to demand a weapon inspection. Glint was the most unnerving of them all. He didn't say much, never cracked a joke, even when somebody else was in a good mood. Nobody really seemed to like him, and he seemed to hate everybody else. He had been miserable back in New Antioch, and only seemed to really settle down as the Aegis left the walls of the city behind. Glint, as far as Ancon could tell, was practically inhuman. He had only ever seen one other person move faster than him in all of his life, and despite his wiry frame and slight build, Anton had witnessed him land blows that winded Burke in sparring, and the man knew complex throws and joint locks that Anton had never been exposed to before. He spoke to nobody, read the Bible cover to cover, and then started again when he was done. Finally, there was Marie Leclerc. She was the only person that Anton knew of who was faster than Glint, and only then with the misericordia she wielded. It was she who had seen to Anton when he was first brought back to the Aegis after first meeting the squad nearly a year ago, and it was she who was the easiest to get along with in the entire group. Affable and friendly, her mood never seemed to falter no matter what was going on around her, and sometimes it was easy to forget that she could kill you just as quickly as she could cure you. She also seemed to be unique among the combat medics, eschewing the traditional white garb for a soft yellow and brown weave instead. It made her tough to spot in the desert, and when he asked about it she told him that heretics would try to take out leaders and medics first, to leave the rest of the squad in disarray. There were others who seemed to drift in and out of the squad, yeomen and shock troopers seconded to Schrall's command, men and women he trusted if he needed them, but he liked to keep the rough and ready small and focused. Anton had heard Schrall refer to his unit as mission specific, and he wondered what kind of part he played in that specificity. At the thought of heretics, Anton turned to the west, as if he would be able to see through the five miles of dense forest that separated them from the small abandoned base that was their target. Schrall had only told them the last day in the Aegis that they were hunting yet another artifact, which almost certainly meant that something dangerous would be in the area. Even without knowing it, infernal creatures were drawn to places of power like that, so a firefight was all but guaranteed. Anton felt nervousness brewing within him, so he checked his kit once more as a way to occupy his mind and his hands. Suddenly, Schrall was bounding out of the Aegis, giving the hand signals for quiet and to follow him. They'd make the full five miles in silence, for fear of running into something they'd rather not meet. The hand signals had been the first thing that Anton had learned in basic training, but he quickly discovered that what was thought in the training room was different to what could be used in the field. People came from all over the world to fight for New Antioch, and members of the Iron Sultanate had also added to the lexicon of the battlefield, until the hand signals had become a mishmash of military phrasing, foreign words, and local slang. Anton followed along, placing his feet carefully and quietly, that growing unease turning to a quiet nausea and then into a rolling boil that threatened to make him puke as they got closer to the base. He noticed Shrawl looking at him, and he did his best to tamp down the ill feelings. As they arrived on a small crest above the abandoned base, all was deathly quiet except for Anton's thoughts. His confidence about hitting the field again was starting to betray him and he could feel the nervousness that racked his body start to seep into his thoughts, remembering blood-soaked flowers and churned mud, a final bed for his dead friends outside a small village near Bethlehem. He felt a hand on his shoulder and realised it was the clerk looking at him. A bead of sweat ran down his face, despite the chill morning. Are you okay? she asked. I'll be fine. It's just been a while since I've been in the field. She seemed to take him at his word, 
falling back into the shadowy mist and fog, but he knew she'd keep a close eye on him. As ready as Anton had felt, he knew he was on trial now to see if he was fit to stick with the readies, and the way he felt, he could understand why. Burke moved close to Shrawl, letting the binoculars he had been using disappear inside the great coat he had opted to wear against the chill air. Anton heard him whisper to Shrawl, I can't see any signs of movement, no footsteps in the dew, no fresh churn in the mud. It's dead down there, but there is something odd, a shrine, looks to be to a saint. Shrawl nodded, turned to Anton. You, me and Burke are going down the center, the rest will break off and support the flanks. He set off down the hill before anybody could reply, the assumption being that everyone knew what to do, and if anyone disagreed, then it didn't matter. Shrawl was Shrawl, and what he said goes. Anton and Burke set off after them as the rest of the squad just melted into the trees. They would find their own way down, and Anton wouldn't see them again unless they were wanted to be seen. But he knew that they would orbit Shrawl like moons, and if and when they were needed, they would be there. Shrawl's hand hovered a few inches from his gun as they approached the shrine. It sat at the centre of a small warren of trenches and seemingly abandoned buildings, and Anton felt the strangest pull from it. He had been feeling an odd intuition ever since they disembarked from the Aegis, but he had done his best to ignore it. Now, as they got closer to the shrine, as the pull got stronger, he had to face it. He had been drawn here for the last 10 miles or so, long before they had ever disembarked from the vehicle. Gently, slowly, he pulled his own pistol from his holster, his unease growing. They stopped at the foot of the shrine, looking up at the tangled mass of wood, statues, old tiny spaces for long burned out candles. Rosary beads and dog tags hung from it, knotted together in what was commonly referred to as the soldier's prayer. Many of the men and women of the trenches, fearing their final fights were close, would knot their dog tags through a rosary, hanging them from a shrine such as this and hoping that the ones who came after would spare a moment to pray for the loss. As Anton stared up, he tried to reach for a prayer, but he couldn't find the words. It's Saint Jude, patron saint of lost causes, said Burke, deep gravelly voice quiet against the dewy morning haze. Shrawl blessed himself as he finished his own silent prayer, looking around. We need to get out of here fast, something doesn't feel right. He looked at Anton quizzically, as if expecting the new recruit to lead the way from here. Anton still couldn't find the words from a prayer. Despite all his study of the Bible, he could feel the soft, gentle kiss of morning mist against his cheek, the hard comfort of the knurling of his pistol grip against his skin. As he stared up at the shrine, his eyes began to drift down, past the long extinguished flames, the tattered prayer and hymn sheets nailed to the rotting wood, the beseechments of soldiers long dead. He felt the strongest desire to sink deep into the sod on his feet, to fall slowly into the earth and to be embraced by it all as those soldiers who had gone before him had done, down into the trenches, down into death. He holstered his pistol and dropped to his knees, digging his hands through the loam and the dirt. He didn't know why, but he scraped and he clawed until the debris at the bottom of the shrine parted beneath his hands, revealing a dirty metal surface and some rivets. Shrawl quickly joined him, pulling back sod and bramble, bone and stone until they were exposing the hatch for a bunker. Captain, Anton started to speak, but Shrawl hushed him, gently. Later, we don't have time, Anton. Together, they pulled at the hatch, but it wouldn't move. Burke eventually moved in, wrapping his monstrous hands around the handle and heaving. The muscles in his forearm rippled as the hatch began to groan, finally giving way and opening upward like a long-lost secret being dragged into the open. This place has been sealed for decades at least, said Shrawl, but we can't assume there's nothing down here. Be on your guard. Shrawl dropped down into the hole, lighting a torch from his pack before disappearing from the patch of light being cast through the open hatch. The light from his torch seemed to disappear rapidly, drained away by the inky black of the bunker beneath. Anton followed him down, feeling the hard crunch of something beneath his feet. It was bones, and lots of them. He lit his own torch as the growing light of the flame crept outwards. It revealed skulls and ribs, femurs, and bones that Anton didn't recognize. Most of them seemed human, but Anton saw skulls in shapes that he had never seen before, some with wicked jaws and horns, and he knew that down here the brave defenders of this place lay side by side with the demons that had sought to kill them. Burke was the last in, the big man seeming even bigger than usual down here. His grenade launcher was on his back, and he had a shotgun in hand, 
better suited to any fighting that might need to be done in this cramped place. The bunker felt long dead, however, abandoned by Christ and the devil alike. The suffering that had happened here long since faded, but somehow seemed to echo at Anton from the damp, mossy walls. Only one hall led from the room, so they followed it, and everywhere they went were more bones. Many of them seemed ancient, and Anton saw tatters of clothing, rusted swords and old firearms. Hundreds if not thousands of people had died down here, the death and despair seeping into the walls, and it felt as if they were walking into hell itself. Anton couldn't help but wonder at the madness that had caused so many people to march down here to die, and what they were fighting over. The war against hell had gone on for centuries, and major actions and massive battles had started, been fought, and ended with little record keeping. So many engagements had resulted in brutal stalemates with few survivors on either side. So he knew that sites like this were not uncommon. Still, he could too easily imagine himself lying here amongst the bones, discovered by some other soldiers centuries from now. Despite his fear, Anton knew he had to go forward. Whatever had called him here had a grip on him now, and he knew he wasn't far from whatever relic they had come to find. He moved on ahead of Schroll, but rather than rebuke him, the lieutenant just followed, a pistol in his hand, the torch in the other, and Burke behind. After a couple of short corridors and true long abandoned rooms, they came to the end of the bunker and their prize. Sat upon a plinth of black marble, resting on a tattered red cushion, long since faded and moth-eaten, was a bone. It looked just like the one they had found in the museum a year ago, too big to be human, the dense porous marrow in the middle looking almost like it was made of gold. Without realising it, Anton took a step forward, hand raising, stopping only when he heard the ominous click of the hammer being drawn back in Schroll's pistol. Anton, don't you fucking move, not one inch. Burke, put that godforsaken thing in the box. Burke moved past Anton, pulling a large metal container from his kit bag. He took thick leather gloves from his pockets, pulling them on over his huge hands, then detached what looked like metal tongs from the top of the box. He opened it to reveal the cushioned inside, and Anton thought he saw prayers embroidered in the felt within. Burke carefully picked up the bone with the tongs, dropped it in the box, and then closed it all up again. Anton, turn around, slowly. Anton began to slowly spin, ready to ask the lieutenant what the hell was going on when he saw something that caused his eyes to widen in shock. Coming out of the wall, reaching quietly for Schroll, was a ghost. Its face was rotted away, the skin drawn back over bone and teeth, a pale blue glow emanating from it and the sword it was raising, ready to swipe at Schroll's neck. Before Anton could get out a word of warning, the blade began to fall. Time seemed to slow, Schroll staring at Anton while he desperately started to reach for the lieutenant, his voice trying to form words of warning. The sword seemed fated to cut through Schroll's neck, moving like destiny itself to cut him down, only to be turned away by Glint's knife as it almost reached Schroll's flesh. The man moving quicker than the wind, appearing from the shadows on the far side of the door as if sent by Christ himself. Time to go. There's nothing good for us down here, Glint said. Just then, another creature came from the wall across from Burke, who raised his shotgun without hesitation, letting loose a slug that tore half the monster's head and face away, but didn't seem to slow it down one bit. Burke, we can't fight this, Glint shouted, then slipped through the door he had arrived through. The other three didn't wait, and Anton had more, no more time to wonder what was happening. All they could try and do now was survive. The din in the narrow bunker corridors was deafening, and Anton could barely hear the hammering of his heart in his ears as metal met metal and gunshots reverberated off the walls. The ghosts were seemingly coming from everywhere now, and Anton did his best to keep up with the rest. Burke laid about him like a man possessed, and Anton witnessed him smashing his massive fist through skulls and ripping enemies apart with his bare hands. Slowly, Anton realised Burke wasn't thinking, he was just reacting, and he caught a glimpse of the man's eyes and couldn't believe that they were so wide with fear. Burke was fighting on pure instinct, battling the same fear that Anton felt himself. Ahead, Schrall fired in all directions with his pistol, and when both were emptied, he pulled his sword and dagger, hacking and slashing his way through anything that appeared around him. Everything they cut down seemed to be replaced by another creature, another terrifying ghost of some long-dead heathen. 
They were fighting on the bones of a thousand people who had died this way, trapped in the grim, wet dark of these corridors, and while it seemed to be almost too much for Burke, Shrull was managing to keep his cool, carving a path forward. Glint's face was an unmoving mask, for him this seemed no more than a math problem. The solution arrived at by reducing the enemy count by one as often as possible until they were free of this place. They entered the final room and Marie and Ursula were there, the strange thick congealed blood of the enemy on their weapons. They had clearly been keeping the way as clear as they could. The group fell back towards a patch of light that indicated freedom. They reached the ladder up and Burke launched his kit bag containing the box up and out of the bunker. Marie was first up the ladder, then Glint. Anton went next, then Shrawl. Burke pulled his grenade launcher off his back while Ursula prepared a satchel charge, launched it down the corridor they had just come from. Both of them shimmied up the ladder as quickly as possible, Ursula telling the rest to run when they hit fresh air. They fell back as quickly as they could, feeling the deep thud and hard snap of the charge exploding, lifting dirt into the air and raining it down on top of them. The tunnel would have collapsed in, but Anton didn't know if that was enough to stop whatever had been after them down there. His eyes turned to the shrine, and he finally understood its purpose. Whomever had placed it had done so to keep those things at bay, after the endless slaughter that had taken place. On some level, he knew that everything that had ventured down there had never made it back up again. Looking around, he could see everyone had picked up some sort of wounds. Burke was bleeding from a deep slash across his shoulder and a puncture wound in his forearm. Marie had a large slash down the right side of her face, almost at the ear. Shrawl appeared to be nursing a wound in his left side and one in his thigh. If they had hesitated for even a second, the creatures would have built up their numbers quickly enough to rapidly drag them down and kill them. Glint had saved them all. Anton felt overwhelmed and angry and scared. He had nearly died for reasons he didn't understand and every time he asked a question he was ignored or threatened. His own commanding officer had pulled a gun on him and he wanted to know why. He stormed at Shrawl, losing the run of himself, unable to control the emotions surging through him. What the hell is going on? What is our mission? How did we even know to be here? Shrawl just stared at him, head slightly to the side, a look of careful calculation on his face. Anton could see a decision being made and Shrawl said, simply and quietly, you told us, Anton, in whatever gibbering madness possessed you after we got you back to New Antioch, in whatever conversations you had with the scribes and the priests and the clerics, you told us this would be here. We are here because there's something wrong with you. Some evil has touched you, and rather than put you down, the goddamn Synod has decided they'd rather use you as a truffle pig to find whatever hell-touched artifacts you can. If it were up to me, Anton, I wouldn't have my troops anywhere near you you'd never have made it back out of New Antioch in the first place. You want to complain about nearly dying? We all nearly died. Because of you. Because I've been ordered to follow whatever demented dreams you had and track down more of the very thing that should have guaranteed your death. Anton, were I a good leader, I'd shoot you now and leave you in the mud. He sighed, as if all the anger, fear and tension had finally escaped him. But I'm a good soldier, so I won't. Anton didn't know what to say. He felt like his strings had been cut, nausea boiling in his belly, his legs weak. He sat down in the mud. He looked around at the rest of the squad, but they just stared back at him as if they were looking at a stranger. Slowly, one by one, they turned around and walked away. Shrawl was the last to go, his hand seeming to stray toward his pistol from time to time until eventually he too turned and left without a word, leaving Anton sitting in the shadow of the shrine. At the top of the tangle of wood, metal, paper and prayers, St. Jude stared down at him, uncaring eyes showing no pity for his plight.